Hello, everyone, and welcome to this final webinar as part of the AGO's Year of the Young Organist. We're joined today by two of the people who a long time ago uh, taught me enough to be dangerous, and it, it's so exciting to have them, them both here, uh, Drs. Rhodes and Crane. Dr. Rhodes is a member of the voice faculty at East Carolina University, where she leads the vocal science and vocal pedagogy program. And Dr. Crane is on faculty at Brigham Young University, where he teaches graduate conducting and leads the famed BYU Singers. So uh, it's a, a privilege to have you both here to talk about vocal pedagogy, vocal technique in the choral rehearsal. And I think many of us as organists find ourselves in the practice room alone a lot. And then in the profession, we end up in front of uh, choirs of varying skill levels. And some of us aren't lucky enough to have sung with wonderful people like you before. Um, so I'm hoping that you can sort of give us some insights into so much talk goes into, oh, I, I want to go to a good program. And I'd love for you to talk about how to build a good program, how to make the choirs we have better. So feel free to just take that and run with it and we'll see where we end up. Dr. Rhodes, I'm going to just sort of jump in. I figured you would. Go for it. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Jordan, for the invitation. And it's it's great to be here and Grant as well. And nice to meet you. And um, yeah, so I just want to start out with, to answer your question to say, you know, you know, when we, Dr. Rhodes and I do this kind of tandem thing a lot. Uh, and, and the reason that maybe it's somewhat interesting to people is that my primary job is a choral conductor, but I have a lot of experience as a singer and a voice teacher as well. And then Dr. Rhodes's primary job is as a voice teacher and singer, but also has a lot of experience, including what she does now in, in choral conducting. So we have this kind of like opposite yin yang thing and it's it makes for some interesting conversation. And so to answer that question first, I would just say that, you know, I I started out my career as a high school teacher and I've, I've certainly done a lot of church choir as well. Um, I've done some children's stuff, some middle school stuff. I mean, I've kind of done everything. So sometimes people think, well, you know, you've, for the last several years, you've conducted these top flight university choirs, which is true, but my philosophy always is, and I tell this to my grad students all the time, whatever the, the, the body of humans that are in front of you, <laughs> no matter how humble or how few, uh, your job is to make them better. And that if you'd use that philosophy, I think you're going to find a lot of happiness in your in your position. And I think that your singers will find a lot of happiness if they sense that from you. You're simply trying to make them the best version of them that they can be. So rather than having some like model group or model sound that we're just always dissatisfied because we never get there, I, I try to use that that philosophy to start my approach. Just wanted to say that first. I will piggyback on Dr. Crane and say that um, one of the things that I tell music educators uh, all the time uh, when I come to clinic their choirs or whether I'm at a conference or something and the reality of it is the reality of it is it's easy, especially when you walk into a situation where you've got all these bodies in front of you and they make a sound and I mean, sometimes that sound is um, depressing, you know, especially when it first comes out of them, depending on what the level of uh, skill set there or the experience level or, I mean, who you're standing in front of. Um, and it's really easy to just start problem solving and going, okay, well, uh, right, this is the level I'm dealing with. This is what this ensemble is going to be. Um, and whether you're standing in front of the group of throats that Dr. Crane stands in front of right now, which is an amazing group of musicians, um, or you're standing in front of the group that I get in August every year, um, which is all freshmen, um, and they are 13th graders, and they sound like 13th graders, and there's about half of them that read music and half of them that don't, and about a third of them are music majors, and the rest of them are, you know, just college students who like to sing, um, or you're standing in front of, you know, an average Eastern North Carolina Baptist church choir, which is, I did that too, right? Um, you're not at the mercy of the sound that those singers throw at you in their first rehearsal, ever. 
and you shouldn't take it for what it is. You shouldn't just go, okay, that's the sound. Um, whether it's a great sound that you might get if you've got a group of Dr. Crane singers in front of you at Brigham Young University, or a sound that is like, oh, should it be a different situation? You're not at the mercy of the talent level uh, that shows up in front of you. Your job is to teach them to be better. Um, and what I find a lot from musicians who stand in front of vocal ensembles is that we often take the reins there when it comes to musicianship skill set. We go, okay, well, we're going to help them learn to read a little bit better because in our brain we go, okay, well, if I can just get the music in them quicker or more efficiently uh, or more accurately, then inevitably I'm going to end up with a better product. And that's absolutely true. Um, and we're a little bit less um, wary of finding ways to incorporate um, building musicianship skills for our uh, singers in front of us, regardless of what their level is. But we don't realize that we have the same capacity when it comes to the vocal skill set they show us. We're not at the mercy of that. And a lot of times we look at it and we go, oh, I just have less talented singers or, oh, I have really talented singers. Great, they already make a great sound. Great, got that part, check. No, your job is to always teach them to be better, whether it's better people, better artists, better musicians, or better vocalists. And so I think one of the things that Dr. Crane and I have become really passionate about is the reality that it is our it's our job to make them better singers. When they leave you at the end of a year with you or a semester with you, or they should be better singers. They should have learned something to make them better singers. And your ensemble should sound better because you've got better singers in it by the end of the year than you had at the beginning. Um, and in taking those reins, um, what we have found is that there's a lot of efficiency that comes with actually teaching singers to be better when it comes to problem solving on the podium and that they work very much like that. And so if the way you problem solve um, is rooted in good singing and reinforcement of good singing and basic solid information that all singers really should have their heads wrapped around in a more thorough way, regardless of what level they are, um, what you get at the end of the day is you fix the vocal issue that you hear or the aesthetic issue that you hear, and you also teach something to a singer who is now, you know, a singer with another tool. Great. So, so where do you? I mean, let, let's let's say I'll, I'll pretend that this has never happened to me. Um, <laughs> is that you? You walk into uh, your first church choir rehearsal of your new job and and you encounter a sound which has a, a lot of ways that it could improve. Mm -hmm. Where do you start? That's a great same place. Same yeah. place I would start with Dr. Crane singers when I go out there to say, hi, yeah. welcome to vocal study. So maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll sort of, just to keep things organized forever, and I don't mean this in any kind of a sexist way, Dr. Rhodes. But it's it's sort of the way that this started. Mm -hmm. But let's I guess we could continue only for a pragmatic. Not, has nothing to do with gender. Are you okay with this, Dr. Rhodes? I've met you. You're fine. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So Dr. Rhodes said it right. He says the, this it's basic stuff. Um, and and I know you're looking for pre, pre, specifics, which which we'll get to. Oh, but yeah. I just want to will pinpoint that it's no different for like professional choir than it is for children's choir, whatever. And um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with one. I'll just give you one thing that more and more as I, as I go around and work with different choirs and stuff, this is the one that I feel is making the most difference the quickest. And it has to do with posture. Now, when you hear the word posture, or I know when I've heard the word posture in my life, I go, okay, they're going to tell me to stand up straight and they're going to tell me to get my shoulders back and they're going to tell me to, you know, look as a certain way. Yeah. And, and that's what I've been told my whole life. And I did that for many years as a, as a conductor and it's not bad. There's nothing wrong with that, but that actually doesn't really move the needle in terms of the vocal sound. The thing about posture 
actually there's two things about posture that I'll say that actually move the needle and will change your sound immediately is number one, the idea that the back of your neck should be should feel a little taller than the front of your neck. And I, when I say it, I say it kind of slowly and I make sure that they're understanding what I'm saying and I have them like do it. And so again, we want the front of your neck to be shorter than the back of your neck or vice versa, the back of the neck be taller than the front of your neck. What that does is it sets up your vocal tract in a favorable situation for air to move through it in an unconstricted way. What most often happens, and it's, it's unconscious most of the time, is that we sing a little bit this way, especially adolescent males, but, but everyone, all humans, you know? And, um, and we go this way, and even a distance of millimeters or inches is gonna make a huge difference of sound. So that's one, one thing that I would try, would do immediately. In fact, you can do it yourself and you can demonstrate by singing a pitch and just going, Oh, oh, and you see how just that that adjustment changes the sound a lot. The, the second thing that I would try that has to do with posture is this idea, and Dr. Rhodes and I have come up with a few different ways to describe this. Uh, I have been lately calling it the gunslinger position. It, so if you think about like in the old West, when, when two people are gonna like have a, have a shootout or whatever, they adopt that kind of like lower center of gravity kind of place um, where they're about to reach for their guns. And it ends, up, it ends up the lower half of your body feels kind of springy. It feels kind of like ready to shoot at any moment. And the knees are slightly bent. It's, it's, it's almost imperceptible, but it's this idea of springiness. That's another word that I've been using that helps the breath mechanism to be released and not tight. Mm -hmm. And, and we, even without understanding any of the why behind these two things, behind the tall neck and the gunslinger thing, you're gonna see a marked improvement in the sound from any group of human beings. So every, now I will yield to Dr. Rhodes. Every single group. Now, um, I am incapable, this is just a Jamie Rhodes thing. I'm incapable of not explaining the why. Um, he knows this. Um, even to the student who just wants me to fix it. Like, just fix it, Dr. Rhodes. Okay, fine, I'm gonna fix it, but you're gonna also understand it before you walk out of here. That's just how I roll. Um, every ensemble that I stand in front of, whether it's the BYU singers or the ECU chamber singers, or, you know, insert professional choir, or, um, you know, the church choir that I'm there just to do a clinic on their Wednesday night rehearsal. And the conductor says, hey, will you just come teach us some vocal stuff, make us sound better. You know, um, I'm like, oh, okay. The very first thing I tell them is that they're a wind instrument and they have to understand that all sound, musical sound is just air vibrating through a tube. Every musical sound is air vibrating through a tube. Um, uh, you guys are American Guild of Organists. What is that? Air vibrating through a tube. Right. Um, and I make them aware of the fact that they have a tube as singers. Every single singer standing in front of you doesn't matter what their voice type is soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, baritenor, alto, who basically is your tenor section. Like it doesn't matter. 85 years old, 93 years old, 12 years old. They got a tube. Right. Um, and in the same way that we make our singers responsible for their own musicianship skills and we get them to use it, um, one of the most effective ways to really get singers to buy into things, um, to especially these things that Dr. Crane and I tend to focus on, these basic ideas, is for them to understand, oh, that's my responsibility. Okay, I have a tube and here it is. It runs from here to here. And everything you're gonna encounter on that podium is a problem with that tube, right? Or a lack of problem with that tube, right? Their whole job is to keep the tube open and free of constriction. Um, I usually liken it to any kind of wind instrument that they can think of. And even your youngest kid can picture, you know, a trumpet, right? Um, 
your organists like you would never expect your organ to sound beautiful if you looked at all those pipes and they were all like jacked up and been out of shape and like half closed and there was you know there's a bird's nest down in one of them of course that instrument is gonna sound like trash <laughs> right um the same thing is true of your singer's tube and they're all gonna have one when they go tall neck and they adjust that posture, they are opening that tube, right? If they're here, it's constricted. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what their voice type is, it's constricted. If they're standing on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera making a very large sum of money, which is possible, right? And they are like this, guess what? Their tube is constricted. <laughs> guess what they would do if they did this? Sound better and work less hard. Like that's true, regardless of the level of singer in front of you, you will improve the sound the minute they start focusing on the fact that they've got to keep their tube open. And it works with every ensemble. If they're 12 years old, they can understand, oh, I need to keep my tube open. They start singing, they're busy, they're coming out here, oh, your tube is closed, your tube is closed, what did we learn? Oh yeah, okay immediate change in sound um that's why dr crane's like it's gonna work every single time with every group it's gonna make a huge difference of sound because essentially you're taking the bird's nest out of the tube can i jump in dr rhodes like we Absolutely. like when we do when we do this dog and pony show for conferences and stuff which we've done several times it's basically her and me we just sort of like riff off of each other and cut each other off and basically um, yeah, and make fun of each other and stuff. So uh, hopefully nobody that's watching this is offended. But we know, we've known each other a long time. A long time. <laughs> anyway, um, what I was going to say uh, has to... <laughs> oh, so from the choral conductor's perspective, this, these, these couple of things we talked about, these very basic things. So let's say, again, like Dr. Rhodes said, you get a sound that's, that's offensive to you in some way. From a choral conductor's perspective, for whatever reason we are conditioned to the first things we go to are, oh no, that sound is horrible. Therefore we need to say, sing lighter, or that sound is horrible. We need to talk about the vibrato and you know, can you have less vibrato or that sound is horrible. So we need to somehow sort of adjust our mouth shape to make sure that, the, that it's not quite so brassy or something. We do these kind of cosmetic fixes. And I wanted to admit that I've, I've done that and I probably still do that to a, to a lot to more than I should. But um, that for whatever reason, uh, we choral directors, we go straight to those things that may create some semblance of improvement in the moment, but actually aren't getting to the root of the problem, which are the things that uh, Dr. Rhodes is talking about now, This just this idea of the tube. So yeah. I just wanted to throw that in. It's the idea of sort of treating the symptom and not the actual issue. Um, it's, it's that idea of having your singers sing something and we hear intonation. We go, oh my gosh, it's out of tune. And immediately we start trying to fix the intonation, right? Which is like trying to fix the fever associated with an infection. It's like, well, maybe let's let's kind of go, wait a minute, why is it out of tune? Let me fix why it's out of tune instead of trying to fix the intonation, right? Um, and almost always it's out of tune because of a problem with their tube, um, which leads us into a handful of other things that Dr. Crane and I often talk about. Um, vowel, real vowel, and this idea of shaping the tube around the vowel. The goal is always to create um, continually moving air through that tube, right? Um, very often we modify vowels as singers. Um, and what we don't realize is that a vowel isn't just one thing, it's two things. There are two parts to the vowel. There's the reality of the vowel, A, E, A, A, O, that's all tongue position. And then there's the color of the vowel right? Um, which is going to give us a different kind of sound, i.e. warmer, brassier, brighter, right? The shape you make with your tube, what, what sound is that going to give you? If I just show you, 
is that going to be a warm sound? Probably not, probably not. Now, it can be any number of vowels, right? But that's probably not gonna give you a warm sound, right? Um, something that goes much rounder, much taller, is probably gonna give you a little bit of a warmer sound. It may not, however, give you a vowel, right? The vowel has to do with the tongue. And a lot of times we hear a singer singing, what, I don't know, give me an example, Dr. Crane Coral person of terrible vowel or terrible sound that on the podium we would go, oh, let me modify that vowel to something not actually real and get kind of a fake. Right. So here's one. The water is wide. Huh? Which is a song that we hear a lot in various arrangements. And there's that ah vowel. And uh, the first, so if I'm regular, most core directors, I hear that my brain's going, choo -choo -choo, okay, it's too spread. Wide. I've got to fix that. And I say, all right, round your lip position in the front to kind of mute it. And can you like, sort of sing a more like an O vowel to, to kind of darken that up. And so the choir will go, the water is warm. And a lot of choral directors are like, yes, thank you. Because they've, they've, you've gotten rid of that offensive sort of- Less rationing. offensive. That less offensive, yeah. Probably out of tune though. It's probably out of tune. And it's not the right vowel. I'm singing the water is whoa Ooh. instead of the water is wide. So, um, so this has been a really big revelation for me as I've worked with Dr. Rhodes about this stuff. Again, understanding that the vowel, the, the pronunciation of the word is created with your tongue position. And there are some people that'll fight us on this. And it's, if you, you can even practice this on your own, just go through different vowels without trying to do anything, just like speak different vowels. You'll notice that those vowels are adjusted by the tongue. And so that's but where I, I start. Also, when I make this point, I usually do it literally like this. Like I will show and I have an entire group of very educated, very successful music educators sitting in front of me. And I will look at them and I will go, what vowel am I singing? And they'll go, oh, oh, do you know what I mean? I'm like, e, <laughs> e. Ah, oh, eh. Guess what's happening? My tongue, right? Now, I am controlling quite a bit the color of those vowels because I'm putting it through a rounder shape, right? If I say E, A, ah, and I make the shape much more collapsed this way, much wider, I'm going to get a different color. But as the person on the podium, a lot of times we forget and we try to fix the problem with the vowel by fixing the color of it or by asking them to sing a vowel instead of like ah, for instance, if we hear it and it's, it's very shallow, very spread, very kind of like uh, diffuse, um, we'll say, no, 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 sing all oh, like A-W. How many times have I been in an ensemble situation and had the conductor say, please write A-W in your music and sing all. Oh. Now do that for yourself. Say ah, like father, ah, ah, mm. ah, and then say all. Oh. Oh. Where does your tongue go? Back. Backwards. Back in your tube. You totally just put the bird's nest back in the pipe, right? The goal is always to keep the tongue forward, um, relaxed and active right against the back of the teeth. E, it, just the way you speak it. Dr. Crane does this a lot with his choirs, the idea of having them speak the vowel and find the vowel and then put the color around the vowel without modifying the tube because the minute they start to bring their tongue back to add color, they're gonna close that tube. And heaven forbid your tenors do that or your sopranos do that. And they're anywhere near the top of the staff. It will sag and pitch yeah. every single time because you've got air spinning through a tube. And if all of a sudden that tube starts to get constricted, that air is gonna slow down. Guess what so, that's gonna do to the pitch? I wanna jump in here and just say, it's there's a bit of this, I call it fool's gold element to this because all the things that have been done and that we all still do this thing about pulling the tongue back and 
you know, rounding your lips and all this, it, they sort of work in a way. Okay. And, and they, they are, it's like fool's gold, right? It's attractive. You're like, oh yes, yes. It's, it's, it's that's, a band-aid. It's a ba- but it's a band-aid. Okay. And um, so doc, we've talked about now making the real vowel with your tongue. And now I want to talk about how to, how to sort of color that. Because if you say, all right, the word is, um, uh, has an E vowel, uh, like the word is C, I, or I believe. We sing a lot of words that songs that have that. I believe. If you say, sing the real vowel with your tongue, that's what you're going to get. E. And then, and then you say, look, Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Crane, I'm doing this. My choir still sounds terrible. They, they're singing the real vowel with their tongue, but it still sounds uh, unsatisfactory. I agree. So now what do we do? Once you've established that the tongue is, is in the right place and saying the right vowel, how do we color it? We got a couple options. One is we can sort of like take our lips and our cheeks and, and do like trumpet thing and go, which is possible. And a lot of people will do it. Um, the problem with that, and Dr. Rhodes will explain this better than I can, is that that, that, that action is actually messing with the tube itself. It's like taking your organ pipe. I like that bird. I'm going to use that bird's nest thing. It's awesome. It's like taking your or- organ pipe and at the top of the organ pipe, flaring out the, the metal in a way that was never intended to be flared out. Okay, so that's you changing. You squeezed. Right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to change. So, so what can you do instead? Uh, I've here are just a couple of ideas. It's, it's what you do on the inside of your tube, not on the outside. So Spoiler, <laughs> it's not this. Right, and it's not about the jaw. It's not about lowering the jaw, okay? But a, I'll, I'll say a couple, and Dr. Rhodes will say a couple. She talks about the, uh, the image of an egg. So, you know, think of a, an egg that you buy at the store before you crack it, okay? And if it's laying on its side, that's a sort of uh, horizontal position on the inside of your, your tract here. But if the, leg is th- if the egg is standing upright, that creates a certain sense of, of verticality on the inside. Now, again, that doesn't mean this. It's what's happening. I always talk about what are you doing above the tongue? So if your tongue is saying a certain vowel. Sit kind of on your tongue. You don't yeah. drop your jaw down and uh, space for it. The right. egg right. sits yeah. on the inside and we breathe to make room for the egg. The other one that I'll say, and then Dr. Rhodes, there's others too, is this idea of, uh, I say, about to drool place, <laughs> which, which may seem strange to me. So I, I talk to the students, okay, imagine you're in class and you're, you're listening to a really boring lecture and you're sitting at your desk and you're just about to like fall asleep. You have that moment, you're just about to drool. And there's a sense of total like release and, and softness in this area right here which is the opposite of what you get when you do a really cheesy grin. There's tightness there, there's there's tension, but the about to drool place is the opposite of that. And if you can kind of get that going with your correct tongue vowel position, you're gonna be a long way to getting that kind of balanced chiaro scudo that you're after. All right, I'll stop talking now, Dr. No, you're doing great, Dr. Crane. You've learned so much, (laughs) I'm proud of you. Uh, He's getting there. I'm getting him. Um, I talk a lot about um, this idea of keeping marshmallows between your back teeth. I talk about the little miniature marshmallows, like, you know, I'm talking about the like the little squishy ones. Um, and I tell my students that between their back teeth, they should have the space of about a mini marshmallow. What that does anatomically, it releases the muscle in your cheeks. And it helps you release your jaw so that we have this elusive idea of the palate, right? Um, And you want to feel this lift that goes there. That's where you want your singers to be. All of a sudden, when I breathe and I put like little, I put the little mini marshmallows between my teeth. It's that sensation. Dr. Crane's talking about it as this sensation of release, right? This kind of drooly let go. I think about it as actual space back there for my singers. It's like you have tall neck, open your tube release right there, that's going to help you make space for a warm vowel up on the inside. All of a sudden, I don't sound like I'm from Eastern North Carolina anymore because I now have made my tube 
round like an egg on the inside. I've created this upper space. I've given it much more warmth much more resonance space, right? I am using, I promise you, I am saying the exact same trashy Eastern North Carolina vowels with my tongue that I was saying three minutes ago. The only difference in Jamie Rhodes from Eastern North Carolina who talks like this is diphthongs, one I'm using a lot of them because they belong in speech here. I'm also putting it through a really collapsed, wide, nyah space. That's why you get that sound. The minute I let go of this, tall neck, I take a breath through that. All of a sudden, now I've got warmth, I've got depth. I've also got a vault on the inside. I talk about L space, like upside down L, so junk, junk right? Versus upside down J on the inside. Young singers totally get that. Church musicians get that. Like that's not difficult. I'm not talking about formants, right? But that's solid voice science. And what it does is you let go here, you let go there. You're going for that air that goes up this way in the front and not straight back. Dr. Crane, I'll let, maybe you can talk about the air that goes up versus the air that goes straight back that, that actually kind of corrects um, a misunderstanding for us when it comes to space. But I talked to my singers about the fact that they wanna be responsible for their tube. It has to stay open and it has to stay long here and vaulted this way on the inside. Scientifically, air's coming up. It's gonna hit a curve and keep going faster. If it goes up, and hit something that isn't a curve, it's gonna slow the air down, right? The minute that curve starts to go away, your air is gonna slow down, your pitch is gonna start to sag, you're gonna start to lose the color that you're looking for. Um, and it's the difference between that elusive free singing versus the effortful singing. Yeah, right? and that, that um, the J versus the L thing, I don't know if this is even scientifically correct, but it reminds me of the shape of an airplane wing. It is. right. There's that rounded thing that For has movie, something to do with the aerodynamic eff mm -hmm. eff efficacy of that wing. It's yeah, the reality like, that mm -hmm. when the air hits something that's <laughs> curved, it will speed up. Right. Pressure will decrease and velocity would increase, right? That's yeah. how the airplane keeps from falling. Same thing is true. I mean, think about a roller coaster. Often I'll use that analogy with my singers. Mm -hmm. The idea that the minute you hit that curve, you're going to go faster. Right. right. And I think that's a good segue into the next. And by the way, I've checked in with Dr. Prescott here and he says he, he likes the way this is going. So we're just going to keep, keep just vomiting out information. Um, but I think that brings us to the, the next kind of big post of our spiel, which is about breathing. All right. What other thing, I mean, I mentioned the posture at the beginning of this lecture, but what other thing do we talk about perhaps more than any other in, in as choral conductors is the concept of breathing. And, um, you know, it, we've come about this in so many ways and so many conductors have said it in diff with different techniques. And there's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, and a lot of overcomplication of the situation. And so I'm just gonna, again, say a couple of specific things that we do that can help. And then Dr. Rhodes will probably fill in the gaps of, of the, in the science way of it. But I, I like to use these two ideas of Darth Vader breath versus Coke can breath. And let me just explain that for the second. Darth Vader breath is the one that I was taught my whole life, which is this one that goes, I'm going to see if I can make a sound to it. It's, it's like this. And you can hear that kind of that's the sound that Darth Vader makes. And if you make that shape with your body, all of a sudden you'll feel something that our brain will process as, yes. oh, I have a lovely open round yes. face. Yes, yes, it's again, so that, open. that's the fool's gold. That's the Band-Aid thing. Not all at right? all open, totally closed. <laughs> yeah, which is counterintuitive, okay? Um, and it also, what that can do, if you, if you go for that Darth Vader breath, it can pull the tongue back every time and probably always will do that um and the other thing is the darth vader breath is slow by nature you know if you think about trying to it's just it goes <laughs> and and uh 
a lot of voice teachers and conductors will tell you that's the desirable thing is to take this nice slow breath in fact let's breathe together over 10 counts to show <laughs> how slowly we can sort of pace the in breath by the way i have done all of these things and even still do them i i but i'm trying i'm learning there is a place for it <clears throat> right there is a right. place for having students breathe or singers breathe in over four counts exhale for four counts right there's a way to use that right like, but it's not for the thing for not for the reason that we think that not we're for the reason it. we think yeah right so anyway to quickly tell you about the the coke can <clears throat> i also call this a surprise breath sometimes um and Dr. Rhodes will talk about this thing above the hand thing. But anyway, when you open a Coke can for the first time, there's that fast sensation and that kind of um, Sizzy. uh, sizzly place, Sizzy, yes. right? And so that kind of breath sounds like this. Yeah. Versus Darth Vader. Okay, now if I, if I give those two examples to 100 choral directors, I bet 80 are going to say the Darth Vader one is the is the preferred one. Well, because that opens <clears throat> the throat. Right. And brings the most air in. According to their their understanding. According to what they <laughs> understand. And it's coming from a good like they're they're working towards the right, the absolute right, best of course, interest of their yeah. thinking across the board. It's just a little misunderstanding. But this this Coke can one actually truly physically raises the palate and actually truly physically gets the air moving in the right direction which then actually truly gives you real resonance mm -hmm. the other thing is the opposite of all those and gives you darker and gives you more mature but what it also is going to give you is out of tune okay because you have no overtones now with which to to lock in chords um, it's going to give you diffuse vowel or imprecise vowel, and it's actually going to get you, get your singers tighter and tireder more quickly. And with that, I'll pass the baton. Yeah. Um, it's also this, um, from a very kind of basic standpoint, it's this idea of making sure that the breath happens in an energized way. Um, we want an energized airflow. We want an energized sound, regardless of dynamic level, regardless of style, regardless of, of color, no vocal- Or vibration, width of vibrato. Or, or with or without an excessive amount of vibrato, it does not matter. We never want a slow stream of air on the exit, right? We always want something energized, even at the softest, most precious dynamic, we know that that energy still has to be there, right? Um, it has to be in the body, it has to be in the breath. Um, but we don't think about it on the inhale. And the reality of it is bringing the air in is, I mean, even back to the like earliest, like father of pedagogy, Manuel Garcia Jr., right? If you, if you go through the history of vocal pedagogy, um, the, the person who really kind of got the ball rolling when it came to really taking the body and function and the laryngeal mechanism, all those things, and putting them towards science and marrying it to musicianship and, and all the, the vocal sounds we're trying to make. Even he talked about this idea of the inhalation and the onset of sound having a direct result on the sound that we get, right? Um, and so often when you tell your ensemble to sing, they will do nothing. They'll just start singing. Even if you give them the most beautiful, energized prep, they're gonna go, ah, it's like, ah, take a breath. Very often I will, I will tell them they've got to turn the car on before they can drive it. And if they don't turn it on with energy, right? That idea of like, zoom, turn the air, like crank the car all the way, right? It's not this meow. No, it's crank the car so you can drive no, regardless of speed or what path you're about to take, right? Um, if they don't turn on the car before they sing, then the air is already going slower than they want it to go, or they're starting from stop. The idea of breathe and hold, air is totally stopped. Also their body completely tense, right? Um, and then the only way to get that air moving again is to push it. 
immediately you've got um, a, a lesser vocal sound happening uh, and a less free vocal function. The idea of breathe with energy, sing with energy, in and out, in this way, not that way, in this way, that's gonna give you the J curve. That air is gonna go in just like this, come back out immediately. I wanna right? jump in here again, kind of from the choral conductor perspective on this thing. Um, as you're working with your choir on this, this concept of breathing, and I noticed that when I started doing this, I would occasionally see shoulders raise a little bit. I would occasionally see the chest lift a little bit. And when I first started doing this, I saw that and I was like, oh man, I'm losing my religion about what we're supposed or, to do. Or Dr. <clears throat> Crane, you heard something. Right, exactly. In fact, more to the point, I actually heard the breath Air. happen. And all of those things I had been told were like cardinal sins against singing, i.e. a breath that was not silent and a breath that moved the upper part of my body somewhat. And I have learned to not fa fear those things. And I'm going to, I'll talk about the truth in that principle in a second, but not only to not fear those things, but actually if I don't hear the breath, I stop and, and correct that <laughs> because that means what they haven't done was energized. Now, what, what they have done was not energized. Now, uh, there's truth in that, okay? And Dr. Rhodes has taught me about this. You obviously don't want a, an inhalation that will tighten you up like this, <gasps> where you're similarly, like if you have a kid that, you know, has the croup or asthma or something, and they're all, their airway is all constricted. Of course, you don't want that. And a really noisy breath can be an indicator of that. Okay. That is what it's an indicator of. It's that idea, we get this idea that the air should be silent. It's not because the air should be silent coming in. It's because the sound that we hear tells us that the throat is closed. We hear air hitting constriction. <gasps> yeah. That's why yeah. it's bad. It's bad because of what it tells us, not because we hear it. Exactly. And it's so, it's, it's this idea of not don't hear anything because if you don't hear it, like I will have applied like one-on-one -on -one studying to be uh, opera singer peoples come into my studio. And these are prospective grad students or professional singers who are like coming in for a tune up or whatever. And they come into my office and they take their breath and it sounds like this is their breath before their gigantic aria. That's going to take so much body energy and they take a breath and I hear nothing and I see nothing. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, and this air, I mean, <coughs> you must hear it. You must feel your body move now. Not all movements and not all sound on the breath are created equal. Some of them indicate energized air and a free open tube and an energized body. And some of them indicate tight body closed tube. And so the, the issue becomes hearing and seeing the right sound and the right. right body movement as opposed to hearing nothing and seeing nothing. Well, and one of the ways that I will encourage that too is by showing them via video and myself, but also playing them audio of professional singers, of professional vocal ensembles and say, now let's watch what happens. Let's listen to what happens between phrases and to see them have that kind of togetherness in the way they take the breath. But I wanted to jump in and just say one other thing about, from the choral connector perspective, and it has to do with our gesture, okay? Because we work so hard, and, and those of you that have, that have advanced degrees in conducting and sacred music and stuff have worked so hard on your gesture in your private lessons with your maestros, and, and, uh, and I see it all the time. There's just this like, this calling card of the, the studied conductor. And see if I can, if I can sort of demonstrate. I'm going to point. Yeah, you're going to have to because yeah. I can't do it. Okay, so I like, cannot do it, especially in the way that they they um kind of start a phrase. There's this sort of sense. Let's let's say the phrase starts mezzo piano. Look how clean I can be, right? I'm going to and embody, beautiful, might I add? Thank you, thank you. Very beautiful. I'm going to embody this mezzo piano phrase, which has this. I know the music is soft and it, it needs a certain sort of round edge to it. So let me show you how that looks. And my choir is now singing. Okay, this is, I, I would get an A on my conducting exam for that. Okay, but if I do that and I don't care who the choir is, if they're like professional choir or middle school choir, if I do this, 
for their opening them. prep, they're not going to sound good. Even the pro choir, they're going to sing soft, but it will be a soft singing that is devoid of, of buzz, that's devoid of resonance. Uh, because and so the I've air is moving at the speed of smell. Like it is, it is so slow yeah. and there is no way to energize it unless those singers start pressing on it. And the minute they press on it, you're going to go because you're yeah. going to hear this pressurized, overly bright sound that's going to start going even more out of tune. That's right. But you look really beautiful. Well, like, thank you. So but I'm going to share an experience that happened literally just like two weeks ago when we were overseas. I, one of my singers came up, came up to me and said, I mean, my, I have really very intelligent students. They're kind of very thoughtful. Yeah. Um, um, and so one of my singers said to me, I noticed that when we performed such and such this, at this last concert, because we did 15 concerts, and they said, you gave us this prep, and I'm not going to show it to you yet. I'll show it to you in a second. You gave us this prep that really worked because it really looked like what we have to do when we sing. And I was like almost crying because I did that. I did it consciously for that reason that they said, okay? And the prep looked something like this. Get my camera. It looks, I was about to start this piece and I went something like this. <sighs> and I opened my mouth and I breathed with them. And that, that's heresy because a couple of things, I'm high, right? You can't conduct high. And you might say that the, um, the ictus or the preparatory gesture for the ictus is somewhat imprecise, right? Instead of this thing, it's like, boom. And also by opening my mouth and by kind of having an active sort of face, I'm not embodying the mezzo piano element of how that piece is supposed to start. But what I did do is prepare, because I think the moment this person was talking about was like, high in the range or something and kind of really needed that springboard of breath to help them through it. If I had just done my typical thing, they would have been tight, you know? And so I have, as I finish here, I have learned to sort of throw out, not throw out completely, but rethink my concept of gesture and how can my gesture help or impede their actual vocalism. Gesture should not just be an aid to to what the composer wants musically, but it needs to influence what our singers do vocally as well. Well, because you're going to get a limited result of what the composer wants if you limit what your singers have at their disposal vocally. And if they did not breathe and their body didn't move and the air isn't energized, they're immediately limited with what they're going to be able to do with that sound, which means you are limited musically, tonally, emotionally uh, in the product that they can then provide you regardless of what you look like on that podium or what you've rehearsed or what you're begging of them or what grade you're holding over their head. If they did not take a breath that turned the car on or energized the body, um, they're limited. Now, just like every other little sacred cow that we've talked about today, there, there's reason why maestros of conducting pedagogy teach you these things absolutely if i'm always here all the time my singers are not going to be connected to their support they're, and they're not going to have the gunslinger thing that i was talking about early on okay if i have imprecise preps and i am never clear I'm, all that stuff there's there's validity to that and it's not that every time i conduct i do this kind of thing you know i just in the moment for that particular attack I knew they needed that. And if I didn't do that, they weren't gonna uh, be successful vocally. I do it all the time. If I know that there's a vocal place coming up, yep. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna prep them like that every single time. Right. If it's a piece that I need them to sing more robustly, that opening like, and I have zero conduct, well, that's not true. Very minimal conducting, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Training. Training. <laughs> Mine is much more on the job. I am solidly an interpretive dancer slash I'm going to do what makes it work, right? Um, but if I need a fuller sound, I'm like this. Like, I'm like down, my hands are like, I get that, the beat going and my hands are down here. Gunslinger right? mode. And they're, That's gunslinger. Yeah, they're, I'm, I want them feeling their body and the breath that they take is going to go. And then I might come back up here. You know, just because if I don't get that, if they didn't turn the car on, right, um, then there's no capacity for them to have a tube that's open. The idea of 
the sound living above the hand. That's the sing above the hand thing. If their hand goes here, they should feel that egg and those vowels and everything kind of above it. That breath that goes in this way gives them that and they should hear it. And it, I hold them accountable for it in the same way that I hold them accountable for tall neck. It's like, nope, I didn't hear it. Nope, start it again. You're not gonna sound good, but it's about hearing the right thing. And if I have, you know, 40 people in an ensemble and they all do this. Now, they didn't do this, <gasps> right? Right, but if they all go, I'm gonna hear it. And I wanna jump, jump in here and you're talking about, you set up these, these principles okay and and so what we've done at BYU honestly we're now going to be in our seventh year of or eighth year of doing this we begin the the year and it's gone from just my choir to now all the choirs at BYU we bring out Dr. Rhodes and we have this I don't really like this term but a sort of a boot camp of sorts right we start the year with this heavy like dose of all these little principles now if you, any principle that we're saying today taken by itself is not like rocket science it's just a little germ of information but we make sure that every single kid in that ensemble from my choir to the you know to the lower level or whatever you want to call it understands these few basic principles now the power in that and I, I just, I can totally attest to this, is that when you draw, well, when, when, when uh, problems happen in the, in the rehearsals later in the semester, you can literally say something as simple as, hey, can you prepare your body better for this moment or whatever? And you just say that. That's all you it, do. And it fixes it. Whereas <laughs> it, in my- Immediately they go- right. Because you taught them these few principles about, or about having their tube be in the in the most correct, no more birds' nests in their tubes, right? And and so it, let's say if I hear like these pitch problems, or I hear a sound that's dull, or the sound that's too bright, or whatever, I just say, okay, uh, you know, set your body in the right position now. And if they don't do it perfectly, I listen and I'm like, okay, what element is missing? Did they not quite have a tall enough neck? Did they not quite have? Is it did not they energized do enough? yeah you're enough of the energy in the air and i just and i just moving and i just make that little correction and then the problems are solved also i will say that my warm-up period which i don't like that word either but the first depending on like at the beginning of the year it's maybe it's it's 12 minutes but by the end of the year it's like four minutes that, that first period I'm, I'm just doing simple scales like whatever exercise you want to do it doesn't even matter and, and but each time they sing it I stop in between and I just make a little adjustment. Oh, did you have the, the about to drool place? Did you remember gunslinger? All right, let's do the scale again. And so every day I'm just reinforcing, solidifying those basic principles so that later in the rehearsal, I can just go right back to those principles. And it just saves me so much time. Now, in my former life, I, I, I'll, I'm gonna stop. In my former life, I used to take everything that happened every little problem that happened in rehearsal and put a bandaid on it, you know? Oh, this, okay, you know, do your lips here or make sure you sing that half step a little sharp or whatever. And, and I, I still do those things too, okay? But this has saved me a lot of time. Um, and I just, I, I really believe in it. Dr. Crane, I want you to tell the little story um, or, I mean, I can tell it, I, I, you may have blocked it by now. Um, and Jordan, I feel like you might have a question or want to direct us in a certain way. So um, maybe we let you do that. Um, but do you remember the first time I came out to BYU and kind of played around with your BYU singers? And, Why don't you just tell the story? Because Yeah, I figured I would do it better. So the first time I go out there and he's like, um, you know, doing his Dr. Crane thing. And for those of you who know one Dr. Crane or have ever been in a rehearsal with him and Jordan, I know you know this well, um, he has that sucker planned within an inch of its life. Um, now you walk in his office and it's like, ah, but if you look at his rehearsal plan, it's the most intricately detailed organized thing you've ever seen in your life. Like it's like at one oh six and a half seconds, like we're going to do these things and we're going to work on that for exactly two, two minutes and 45 seconds. And then we're going to move to here. Like he's got this thing scheduled within an inch of its life. It's really well thought out. Okay, so this is the brain I'm dealing with. So I come in there and I give a handful of like super basic 
This is what we're going to focus on. This is what I want to move. Um, I do the over the hand thing. I get them to shift the way they're breathing. I get this released. I get their head over their body. Um, and he just, he, you know, did like a, a chord or whatever. And they sang a chord. And the sound that came out of these students, he did. And for those of you who know one Dr. Crane, he did the Dr. Crane like cackle, right? Like the joy within his heart just came spilling out of his pores. And it was one of those kind of things. And they kind of looked around at each other like, oh my God, because the sound that came out of these brilliantly kissed by Jesus larynxes, right? Was just like stunning. Okay, so we get back to his office and he's like, and per usual, I'm like trying to talk and he's like, mm, I just need to, let me just, I need, I need to think. I need to think. So he sits in his chair like this thinking as he does. And then he's like, he gets all distressed. All of a sudden he's like, I just, I just don't think I have time for this. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can do it. I already have like, I mean, he's like totally freaking out because he's heard this massive sound. He knows that his rehearsal is already booked solid. Like, he has all these things. He's holding all these balls in the air already of things that he does to get this ensemble to sound the way they sound and to polish this music the way he gets polished. Um, and he's just like, I don't, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do that. Like, I don't wear, there's no more time in the rehearsal. He's like completely freaking out, right? Um, tell them what you found, Dr. Crane, after you started kind of doing the vocal stuff in your rehearsal. Well, I just, it's, it's the exact opposite of what I feared. It saves you time instead of takes more time. You, pay, you make a little investment at the beginning, but it's not even that much of an investment. It's a, it's a few hours to teach them the few things, but then the, the speed with which my ensemble can learn music now and not just learn the notes, they always could do that, all right? But to be able to learn and perfect and sound great is like night and day. I mean, it's so fast now, which I think there are Dr. way fewer band-aids like yeah. he was looking at it as like oh my god I have so many of these things that I have to micromanage in order to get this product at the end of the day <laughs> and the reality of it is if you stop trying to treat the fever you stop trying to treat the rash you're not dealing with the creams and the Tylenol and the blah 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 blah, blah you go straight to the issue and you create a healthy vocal production at the outset you're not dealing with treating all these symptoms. And he's looking at his rehearsal going, well, but I have to have time to do all these things. And it's like, no, 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 you don't because those things aren't going to be there. Right. They're right. just not going to be there. And they aren't, right? It's hard, it's hard to believe that. when they pop in, a reinforcement of the singing stuff very often fixes it. Yeah. All right, Jordan, what do you want to do now? We're at, we're at one hour. <laughs> But this has been so good, and I'm I'm especially appreciative of the way that you sort of wrap this up. And, and as Dr. Crean, you were saying, it's it's all these little nuggets, yes, but it's it's also that when it all works together is when it's really magic, and it, it has to all be together. If you could clarify two things that I think are questions in my mind, um, just loose ends here, and and sort of as briefly as you can, because we're at an hour already. If um when you talk about the breath being and your gesture of the breath being here and the breath you're okay with shoulders i i know well and, and you can clarify this i'm i'm sort of really making a mess of it but we've always been taught to sort of tell our choirs oh breathe low and then expand low uh, what's the truth there what's not the truth there and then if dr rose if you could sort of clarify a six-year curiosity of mine which is what are your students doing with the <laughs> Because I remember yeah. looking at the rehearsal and all of Jamie Rose's students were singing just like this. I was like, mm -hmm. what? So okay, I, I, I'm very happy to answer that first question. Um, all that I remember once taking a high school choir to a clinic thing and, and the adjudicator said, breathe down to your toes. And I think I've said that myself too, which is a nice idea or something. And maybe it gets, gives you some more body in the sound or something. But think about the ridiculousness of that comment when you cannot breathe into your toes any more than you can breathe into your knees like or your like the breath that you take is breathes you breathe into your lungs that is where the air goes and so we actually 
have this little Im image, this animation that I show to the students of, of like a an anatomy or whatever. And as they breathe, the, the lungs expand, which makes the rib cage expand. I'll send and, it to you. Yeah, she can send it to you, which also makes the diaphragm descend. And that is the, the truth that we over kind of emphasize. The diaphragm descends as a result of your inhalation, but the diaphragm is in an in involuntary muscle. You can't do anything to it, okay? Th the best that you can do is get them to take a, a deep breath that fills their lungs and expands their rib cage. And to do that in a released way, the gunslinger sort of bent knees thing helps you be released about that. Right. But it's this, it's, it's not, it's not, and Out I- and down. Yeah, yeah, and um, so- It's a torso thing. That's the thing that I usually have to get um, conductors and singers to understand. Breathing isn't just about low. Yes, if their diaphragm goes down, then this will go out, right? But shoulders, I usually tell them to keep their shoulders as calm as possible. We don't want that happening, right? When they're first learning to move, they may move a little bit. That's something you want to kind of get out of the out of them. But your lungs actually- they're like above collarbone, like the top of your lung sac is above your collarbone, uh, bottom of it being kind of like here-ish, right? Um, diaphragm here moves down, pushes out the abdominal activity. Breathing essentially moves the entire torso. Your chest will go out, ribs will go out, abdomen will go down and out, right? The entire torso, has movement happening when you breathe. Um, and very often I will have educators or singers coming in trying desperately not to move anything from like here up. They're trying to be as still as possible from here to here, right? Um, and that's just not feasible because the reality of it is this activity down here, the idea that the low should happen, that's a result of the upper moving right? And so it's a complete torso. Now, not shoulders. Like I said, that might happen, especially when Dr. Crane was talking about it a while ago, when you're trying to get your singers to really embody what an actual breath feels like. If the shoulders move, that's something you want them to stop doing ultimately, but not at the expense of trying to hold this still because they're going to dampen themselves. It's an entire torso activity and not just a low. In the same way, it's not just the ribs if that makes any sense at all. Um, moving forward to this thing, uh, this is just a, um, it's a concrete image that I use uh, that gives my singers something, something to hook onto. When it comes to the palate uh, and lifting, very often they're like, what am I, lift where or what? And very often they're taught about lifting the palate with the yawn, right? That idea of the yawn. But that's so far back where they feel that stretch. They're usually focusing right on the very end of the yawn where you feel this like, and very much like the Darth Vader breath, that for us feels very open and spacious and full. And it's actually just the tongue pulling back. The beginning of the yawn, they're going to feel kind of right here, right above the hand. That it's that part, I usually tell them it's that, it's that sensation of being in church or on the organ, um, being in church and you're on the front row of the choir or you're on the front row of the congregation. If you're like I was as a kid and your mom's sitting on the organ and she's looking at you and the preacher's preaching and you're trying not to yawn. And so you're trying to stifle it and you feel that little like your eyes start to get cold and it's that little, that's palatal lift sensation. Yes, this might be lifting back here, but we feel it here. And I so you want your singers about, about to sneeze, about to sneeze. That's where you want your singers to focus on that lift there, that sensation of frontal lift. And so I'll have them take their hand and I tell them that the Lord made it this way on purpose so that it would fit right there on top of their lip or right on top of their lip. And I tell them to breathe up in that hissy way. I'll tell them that the airstream should kind of hit right behind the little ridgy hard spot that's right behind your front teeth. See, Jordan's already over there yawning. His palate's going up as we speak. Welcome, you're welcome for that. So you put your hand right here. That air goes up this way. And then I tell them to put the entire sound above their hand. It's a concrete way of boiling down something that's otherwise just sensational for us. Like it's all sensation. It's a way of giving them something concrete to work with. 
the hand is not magic, even though my students call it the magic hand. The hand does zero, right? It's, it does nothing. It is not a magic pill or a wand. All it is, is something concrete to hook into. Essentially, all these things Dr. Crane and I are talking about are more concrete ways of being specific about all the things that we are actively trying to do as vocal music educators, whether we're on the podium or in a studio or in a general music classroom or in a church rehearsal, right? You're trying to get your singers to breathe. You're trying to get them to make a beautiful space with a beautiful vowel, with something that's in tune, that is flexible, that they can sing at, at various dynamic levels with or without um, audible vibrato. Um, like we're, we're working towards the same goals and all these things that we're talking about, whether it's tall neck or um, hissy breath as opposed to this one or turn the car on or J instead of the L or sing above the hand, they're all more concrete and specific ways of addressing the things that we're already out there trying to address. But it does it in a way that kind of jumps over some of the misunderstandings that allow us to sabotage ourselves and sabotage our singers just a little bit without meaning to. Well, I, I know I will come back and watch this probably 10 or 15 times before the next choir season starts. This has been wonderful. If, if you have watched this far and you want to hear the proof that's in the pudding, uh, you should check out both the recordings of the ECU Concert Choir, which Dr. Rhodes conducts, and the BYU Singers, which Dr. Crane conducts, and you can hear um, that it, it works. It, it works very, very well. Uh, so thank you both so much for joining us. And uh, I hope that this has been as useful to everyone else that watches it as it has been to me. I have my page of notes. So I'm good to go. And uh, I appreciate you both very much. Thank you. And thanks for the invitation. Thanks.